Hello, welcome back to Access and welcome to this look at a development team with a unique and long-standing legacy of creating PlayStation exclusive games. This is a video about Ben Studio, the team behind open world PS4 exclusive Days Gone. Starting back in the mid-90s, in the very early days of PlayStation, several core members of the Days Gone team worked with 989 Studios, PlayStation's publishing arm at the time, to create the Siphon Filter series. We spoke to game director Jeff Ross, creative director John Garvin, and studio director Chris Reese about their memories of working not only on Siphon Filter, but other key PlayStation series, and how the studio has taken on the challenge of a project as big and ambitious as Days Gone. So when I came on uh, Ben Studio, um, it was known then as Eidetic. A small mom and pop place that was making games in Central Oregon. Uh, this was back in 1993. You know, when I got there, uh, there was, I think, 12 people. About 12. Probably around 12 people. I saw an ad in the newspaper when, where they used to put out ads to hire people and uh, said, hey, video game designer wanted. And I'm like, yes, that's me. The original PlayStation had just, you know, just launched basically. And it was kind of like a Sonic the Hedgehog kind of, you know, platformer game called Bubsy 3D. It was all, all brand new to all of us. So, we, you know, it was a lot of experimentation. We actually had it in high res. I think we were one of the few high res games in, on the original PlayStation, which today, you know, is just like a postage stamp on the PS4. But <laughs> the original idea is that when we first met up with 989 Studios and started working with them, they had a one page synopsis of what of what Siphon Filter was going to be. Sort of this action spy thriller kind of thing going on and we're like, okay, that sounds really cool. Had the name Gabe Logan, had the name Siphon Filter, which always was supposed to be a working title, by the way. I came on about a year after it had started and I think the team was didn't really understand what they had and as a gamer, I looked around and said, wow, this game is awesome. So I was hired very, very early on in development. They had just wrapped up Bubsy 3D. Uh, they had a prototype using that engine that was just Gabe Logan in the subway and they had trains going by and it was a shooter. I was the second designer on the project. The lead designer was Richard Hammond. The guy was a, a genius and, and he took care of most of the missions and, and the ones he didn't want to give anything up, but he had to, you know, so he gave me, you know, I, I got his leftovers and, and, and still made about seven or eight missions. I also ended up doing all, you know, all, a bunch of the concept art and a bunch of the promotional materials. It was a, a full team effort to do, you know, what was really kind of our first foray into what a triple A title back then really meant. Everybody in the studio was doing two or three things and that's kind of how you were able to make uh, a game with a pretty small team. But I think back in those days, we're talking, we're talking what, late 90s, um, all the studios were pretty small. The hardware was really, really interesting to work on because Again, we were doing a big, ambitious game, so a third-person 3D game um, that was character-driven and shooter-driven. Hard to pull that off on that hardware. There were times where the engine programmer would come to me and say, Jeff, we need 4K of memory from this level. What can you do for me? I remember we had 512K for textures, which is like the equivalent of like one half of one texture in Days Gone. By the way, and some of the issues we never were never able to solve. So if you watch videos of Siphon Filter 1 and, and Gabe is running down the street, you will see that the polygons are dividing on the fly. So basically what you're seeing is the textures warp. Even though the PlayStation 2 added more memory, PlayStation 3 added more memory, PlayStation 4, you to make great games, you're always gonna be pushing the technological aspect of it. You can't just rest on the hardware, doing all the hard work. You have to meet it in the middle and be really smart about how you approach it. I don't know if you guys know the history of where the stealth action genre was at that point. We weren't the only action, you know, spy genre. Uh, game out there. We had actually started working on Siphon Filter before we had ever heard of like Metal Gear Solid. Metal Gear was, you know, came out probably four or five months before before we did. So the big game that had been out before us was GoldenEye. And obviously GoldenEye was a, a sort of an influence. And super, super awesome game. Um, and that was really kind of the only one. I think that we carved out a niche that wasn't Metal Gear, wasn't James Bond, was something distinctly unique. I mean, the first one was I mean, that, that's probably the dearest to my heart, you know, and, and it was, it's actually one of the first games that I finished from start to finish even after we were done with it. Nobody knew Siphon Filter was going to be a hit until after it was a hit. There was just no way to know. The reception for Siphon Filter 1 was huge. Oh, it was super awesome. I mean, you know, yes, it was going from having probably one of the worst you know, reviewed games to, to having something that really resonated, right? And, and, and that sort of really clicked for us. The whole studio took like 
a couple of weeks off and Richard Ham, who was the lead designer on the on the game at the time, he and I basically sat and worked on a script so that when everybody came back from vacation, they had the sequel to roll on to. So what's our next move? Siphon 2 was an evolution of everything that we learned to do before, but we were just we were able to kind of create even more sweeping scope, I think. It really wasn't about fixing things so much as making when we worked on the sequel, we, we just made it bigger. On two discs, I think. One of the first PlayStation games to ship on two discs. And that was kind of a big deal at the time. And we just had a lot more content. It was a lot more ambitious. The story was more personal to, to Gabe Logan. And I think that that's what really kind of makes it my favorite is just the, the sense of betrayal and the stakes were, were far more personal and relatable to people. And you know, it was also one of the first games that you know the sequel literally started a few minutes after the last game ended. So there was a continuity and a serialization. For me, it was literally just sort of a bigger playground to, in a way to, to, to sort of expand everything we were doing. We did Siphon Filter 3, um, you know, which, which uh, Jeff Ross, who's the, currently the game director here, he, he was sort of the lead designer on that one. While he was working on that, I was working on Siphon Filter Omega Strain. Mega Strain was going to be our, our big title on the PlayStation 2, and it was more powerful. There was a lot more things we could do. It had a it had an online adapter, which was for technology at the time. It was you know that was really innovative, and they really wanted uh, games to support it. So we had this brilliant idea that we would sort of abandon what made Siphon Filter a hit, which is hey a story driven experience with Gabe Logan. You know what we're going to do instead? We're going to let you create your own character and there's going to be these sort of more generic spy guys that you could create. It's not really our best title, but I think that we we created a lot of really cool concepts that pushed some things forward. The the idea of of, of uh, challenges that scale with by the number of players in the game was something that we created for that. And all of a sudden you've got three extra players with you who can go in any direction in the level. You know, how do you solve those challenges and how do you keep that gameplay fun? You know, I'm still pretty proud of that game, but you know, it really wasn't Siphon Filter. And it's like, it's one of those things where it was a chance to do something innovative, do something, you know, that sort of stretched us in terms of the technology and the gameplay. But at the end of the day, it wasn't Siphon Filter. So that's why, you know, I kind of feel like we did kind of take a break <laughs> from doing Siphon Filter uh, because Omega Strain was such a different experience than, than Siphon 1 and 2 had been. Please welcome the latest edition to the PlayStation family. So when we started working on Dark Mirror, originally it was meant to be a PS2 game. But then, you know, we found out that they were launching the PSP. The tingly senses go up and it's like, well, okay, we could do something really cool here. So Sony came to us and said, hey, we got this new handheld coming out. We really want, you know, sort of traditional style games. It really allowed us to kind of tighten up the design. Uh, it, it, I didn't even work on that one actually, so it's, it's weird for me to say that. The biggest challenge, as any, any of the designers would tell you, is just the fact that it was it was one stick. Again, not even a stick, but a nub and face buttons. How do you bring a two stick game down to a nub and face buttons <laughs> and control it and control it well? We spent a lot of time just trying to innovate on the controller. The design team on, on Dark Mirror really kind of, they, they, they took the series and they focused it. They created really tight mission design. You know, I think we actually succeeded pretty well in creating sort of an auto aim system that allowed you to move and using the face buttons for, you know, to look for with the camera. Created a really compelling game that kind of reinvigorated the series for not only for the fans, but for us. And then we wound up doing another one on the PlayStation Portable Logan Shadow, which was just a continuation of that story and helped resolve it. And it was actually the last Siphon Filter game that we made. What's funny is I don't know that, that I could get away with that now. Spoiler alert, Logan Shadow Gabe Logan gets killed and dies at the end of it. You don't just sort of kill off main characters or kill off franchises without a lot of discussion. Back then, it's like, yeah, I could write that script and say, yeah, we're gonna do this. <laughs> and, then, and then we just kind of did it. Resistance Retribution, only on PSP. Yeah, I think at that point, you know, we're, we're basically, you know, sort of 10 years into the franchise with Siphon Filter. So we were looking for an opportunity to kind of start doing something different. There's got to be something else we can do. And again, PSP was really successful. So we were approached again by Sony saying, hey, we're thinking about bringing Resistance to the PlayStation Portable, what do you guys think? When the resistance opportunity came up, there was something where we loved the game. The first game had been out at that point. I think two was 
Two was out during the course of development. I personally am a huge fan of, of Resistance One because I like the vibe. I like the sort of World War II, you know, the the sepia tone, the art style, the, the voiceover that they did. The high concept was great. The weapons and the core gunplay were just amazing, and the creature design. Just this kind of like you know newsreel sort of sort of approach they took to it. Immediately, what we did was push back and say no port. You know. We're gonna do, you know, we're gonna do this title. It's not ours, but we're gonna make it our own. We basically pitched, hey, we could do a resistance game. In fact, while we were finishing Logan Shadow, we worked on a demo um, for resistance just to prove that we could create a European style town, you know, with a big drop ship and a, and a chimera and in uh, this character who could fight them. So we had a, an actual working demo. Um, I don't remember the name of the chimera type, but it's the guy, the big guy with the cyclops. I mean, it was one of the big ones. And, and it, was a, it was a fully playable demo that looked and felt like resistance. Here we have another challenge yet in front of us. We're gonna take a first person shooter and bring it to third person. James Grayson, he was a, a former Royal Marine who uh, suffered some really uh, nasty interpersonal uh, tragedy at the start of the game. And it was just a really cool stylistic kind of a, a, a game that felt like it was something from the 40s, you know, but it was still in, in current technology and it was really, it, it has this romantic sense about it, is an epic adventure of kind of some, some somebody that everybody can relate to. And, and they say, yeah, I, I understand what he's going through. Sign me up, I'm gonna go through it with him. And it's one of my favorite games that we've made too. You remember why I got into all this? Yes, I remember. Well, then why don't you tell me why I've wasted so many years working crap jobs for guys like Dante? This is uh, Nathan Drake. Oh, you're the expert on maps, <laughs> artifacts. Right. This? This is why you're here. You know, the interesting thing about that is that uh, Ben Ben Studio, we were Ben Studio by that point, we were actually part of the hardware development. This was a very unique opportunity because of our experience on the PlayStation Portable. You know, I remember sitting in a room with a bunch of other developers when they were just, you know, they had a whiteboard and they had, you know, some bullet points up and they were talking about this new, because it was all top secret at the time, they were talking about like, hey, we're going to do a next generation handheld, you know, what do you guys think that should be? In terms of memory and CPU and GPU and, and just even development, how, how can we make development much more enjoyable? We were the, one of the ones who fought really hard that, hey, if this is going to be a portable game dedicated machine, then and then you gotta, and you're gonna put one stick on it. Then you gotta put both sticks on it. So when when the Vita came out and they're promising two sticks, we're like, yeah, this is us. You know, we can we can totally do something great here. What's it gonna be? As we're working on that, that's you know. So the opportunity then came. Well, what about bringing Uncharted to this? You don't see that every day. You ain't seen nothing yet. We had a choice of a few different types of projects we could have worked on for the Vita, and we were the ones who chose Uncharted because again, we're huge fans, and we're like, okay, that's crazy. But let's do it. Let's do it. Most of the team went down to Naughty Dog. We spent a, a couple days there. Amy Hennig was the creative director at the time and was working on, I think, Uncharted 2 at the time. Got to meet with Amy, got to meet with a lot of the designers, a lot of the engineers and artists. She, she's really, really good. I mean, they're all really good. Um, you know, but she's very protective of Nathan Drake and the, and the other characters. We said very from the start, this is not going to be a port of an existing Uncharted title or even a port that would allow us to create a new Uncharted title. We wanted to create a new story, new characters. And, you know, and maybe this was Nathan Drake a little bit, you know, not as young as you saw him in the flashbacks in, say, Uncharted 3, but, but before you really see him in, in Uncharted 1. So there was a period of time there where we could say, hey, this is who he was at that point. He's going to have this adventure. If you're making a game about an adventure and you have a, a, you have a device that's tactile, you know, like all the movies tell us and Indiana Jones holds artifacts that he dusts them off, he blows them. And, and you know, you hold things, parchments to the light and do, you, know, you manipulate light. And well, like this hardware is just built for this stuff. It was a new way of looking at production, even down to how we were doing performance capture to get the performances, the same kind of performances that Naughty Dog were, were able to produce for the Uncharted series, and we needed to make sure that we were genuine in that because we wanted people to feel the same Uncharted. That was super important to us. It, it's actually not only one of my favorite games, but it's the one I'm probably most proud of because you, you, we were a launch title. Launch title. It was the launch title. In Japan and in the US, and we just had a lot of kind of 
the, the degree of difficulty was already high and we kind of stepped up and, and we delivered every time. It was actually kind of silly of us to think that, you know, we could do a Naughty Dog quality game on a handheld with a team of 50 people. Um, and again, in hindsight, it was just kind of crazy that we even thought we could pull that off. It required us to sort of expand our team in areas that we hadn't, hadn't explored before. And so the fact that the Golden Abyss um, turned out pretty good, I think. Um, I, you know, I think uh, it was definitely a huge challenge and it was, uh, it was a lot of fun to work on. But those days are gone. Now I'm a drifter, a bounty hunter, a mercenary. So right after that, um, that's when we started thinking, okay, what's next on the docket? Maybe we could, you know, be counted on to create something new for the PlayStation 4. You know, maybe we should explore new IP. It took time. You know, we had to do, we, we dug really deep and did a lot of exploration. We did a lot of prototypes. The first year we spent kind of kicking around ideas, making pitches. Just putting ideas together. I think the, the idea for what, for what Days Gone turned into uh, was there from the beginning. We want to make this open world game on the PlayStation 4 that's different than the kinds of open worlds you may have played. It's going to be in the apocalypse. It's got a, you know, a focus on this type of vehicle, the bike, that has this kind of a character. The Horde was important from the beginning because that was our showpiece piece of technology. Like, how do we get this many creatures on the screen at once, showing them move like, you know, fluidly through uh, obstacles in an environment was, was super important to prove, prove the concept. The entire team really did have to evolve. Ultimately, I, th I think the studio does, you know, feel the same, but it's obviously grown. We've, we've grown in, again, in, uh, just like what we had to do for Golden Abyss. We were just six mission designers, I think, on the previous games, you know, and then we went to a game that is highly systemic, where there's, there's not conventional missions like we used to, in, in every game we made before. Every square inch of real estate was kind of handcrafted. Like this, this polygon right here is where the player's gonna stand and there's gonna be a guy here sniping down at him. He can peek out, maybe he's got one option. Here, the whole world is, is, has an option. We don't know what's gonna happen at any given point. We have a slide and a deck from like 2014 and for a green light meeting where we said, how does a team of 50 guys make a large AAA open world game without uh, the full support of Worldwide Studios? Because it's not just us, right? We have Visual Arts and Services Group in San Diego and the music and the, and the sound teams and the mocap studio that they have set up in LA now. You know, those things really kind of helped, helped us do that. So I really like in Ben Studio making Days Gone on the PlayStation 4, an epic open world action adventure systems driven game with a horde. Uh, I, I consider Deacon's challenge there the equivalent of what our challenge was making this game. This game was our horde and, and, uh, and I think that we beat it. Thanks to everybody at Ben Studio for taking the time to speak to us and reflecting on a long and storied legacy of producing PlayStation exclusives. They're back with Days Gone, which is out on the 26th of April. Thanks for watching, subscribe if you like this video, and do let us know about your favourite Ben Studio game in the comments. For the players.